a pleasure to introduce Girish Chowdhury, who is um, coming to us to talk about work in agricultural robotics, which is very near and dear to my own heart. Um, he has a robot up here, uh, and uh, he has some great things to talk about. We've crossed paths on similar programs in the past, and um, I can't wait to see what he has to say. So yeah. Thanks, George. Yeah, it's a, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here at CMU and this, this RI seminar. Of course, CMU has led the way in making a lot of systems, so um, robotic systems, and really kind of shown what can be done with those. So today I'm going to talk about this robot, essentially. It's called TerraSentia, and see, we made a lot of them. Uh, let's see, okay, this works, okay. We made a lot of these robots, to be exact, we made 40 of them. This is number 36 that I have with me. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about why we did this uh, and what, does it, what it means for agriculture and where we want to take it from here, right? So, um, so essentially, my, my group, which is called uh, FRESH, which is, stands for Field Robotics Engineering and Sciences Hub, um, does a lot of different types of things. Uh, mostly, we work on field robotics. We also work on learning and autonomy. And the projects that I'm going to talk about today are funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the ARPA ETERAMEP project, and a couple of NSF projects. But towards the end, I'll also talk about our new MURI um, in the area of uh, soft manipulation. So, so what we're you know what we what we're really known for is adaptive control, right? So this is some of my work in which the airplane, as it's flying, throws half of its wing off in mid-flight, right, and then adapts to that failure. So as it's flying, so it throws half the wing off. It doesn't know that half of its wing is gone. It only knows that something has changed, and then it adapts in real time. And to me, this is the level of autonomy that we really need in order to get systems deployed broadly um, and widely in the field. So of course, this particular work uh, used a lot of different types of heuristics and mechanisms to kind of get this working. So the big question that we ask in my group is, how can we design autonomous systems that have this level of adaptability in the real world, right? But for the last past three years, we've been kind of working on this problem of agricultural robotics. So trying to move a lot of these things from uh, aircraft onto these drawn robots. So the first thing what I'm going to do today is tell you how we got started in that problem. And particularly, I'm going to talk about uh, the high throughput phenotyping problem. But the overall idea is that robots and AI together can alleviate the labor bottleneck, right? And throughout the talk, I'll kind of make this, this points to pointers to why labor or lack of labor or lack of uh, you know, labor at the right price is preventing agriculture from being as sustainable as it could be. Um, and essentially, the goal is over time that if we can you know, improve our current systems, we can enable more sustainable types of systems, we can transform the way we do agriculture today. Right? And this, is, this, this kind of like this robot and this work has been getting a lot of coverage. So if you want to kind of follow up on this, you can uh, take a look at this article that showed up on the Unmanned Systems magazine. And you know, Corey, uh, is, uh, Rory Jackson did a really good job of kind of like covering some of the details of the system that I might or might not miss today, today's talk. Okay. So to begin with, um, so three years ago, I knew nothing about agriculture. So I was working mostly on um, aircraft systems. And I, I kind of moved to Illinois, and I started getting, you know, if, of course, you go to Mil Illinois, you're kind of in the middle of corn and soybean, right? So no matter where you go, it's just corn, corn, corn all around you. So it was very surprising to me when Stephen Long, in one of his talks, uh, told me that corn did not exist in nature, right? So not only does it not exist, you know, it was not only is it from Illinois, right? It just simply did not exist in nature. So as I started digging back into it. There's this article that you can read on the tracking the ancestry of corn, you find that corn was bred from this plant, selectively bred from this plant from in the South Americas. This plant is called Teosinti, right? It's still, it's still around. You can still find it. Uh, it's barely edible. But over about 9,000 years, you know, the folks from South America selectively bred corn with different plants until we got, got corn. Now, the really amazing thing that you know, a lot of us as engineers just simply don't know, is that most of the plants that we eat today, and in fact, most of the animals that we you know, consume today or work with today are actually selectively bred from some things that didn't look like them. So other than barley and maybe oats, so some of these really ancient grains, most of these grains that we eat today are selectively bred. 
So currently, right now, under the North Pole, there is a repository of grains, right? So or cultivars. So if in case we get hit by a meteorite, we don't have to go 3,000 years back, right? And uh, and recreate these things. So when we say we figured out agriculture, that's kind of what we did, right? We created, we domesticated crops so that we can grow them. Uh, but there's a real need to accelerate this pace of selective breeding so that we can feed the world. As you know that the global population is increasing. It's 7 billion now. It's expected to go to 10 billion before it settles. And, you know, and, you know, in order to, and the, the, I guess the challenge is that where the population is growing, the yields are very low. For example, in Africa, population will grow, I think, twice in the next 30 years, but yields are three times less than what they can be. So in order to do this, what the breeders are doing is they're solving this problem called high throughput phenotyping. And what they're really doing is they're trying to do genome-wide association. So what they do is that all of the plants uh, that we eat today or consume today, the genes for them have been sequenced. We can measure the environment, and genes in presence of environment result in traits or phenotypes, right? So for example, in humans, the color of your eyes is a, is a phenotype. Right? It, is, it exp expresses differently depending on you know, the, the genes that make you and the way uh, you were in the womb. So phenotypes need to correlate back to genotypes. And what people in breeding are trying to do is they're trying to find which clusters of genes relate to which phenotypes. If they can do that, so nature versus nurture or nature plus nurture gives you a particular trait. If they can figure out this correlation, then they have a more mathematical way of doing selective breeding than the trial and error methods. So in order to do this, they run these massive trials. So this is a 40-acre trial in which there are 866 varieties of sorghum. And you'll see that they're in like these three by three meter plots, right? And if you look carefully, you'll see slight differences in the way that they're growing. What they're trying to do is that in this area, with those 866 diversity panel, they're trying to find which varieties are doing better. And the big bottleneck there is that most of these measurements are done manually. So this guy is measuring corn, like he's literally counting corn. Uh, these two are measuring the height. So counting corn, you know, it's time consuming. Measuring height is not only time consuming, but it's also inaccurate, right? I mean, uh, how do you measure the height of a plant? And then she's here measuring the width of the stem. And at this point, people kind of start giving up, right? And so there's a lot of data that, that could be used for improving breeding. It's just simply not collected. And this is, has led to this thing called a phenotyping bottleneck. And George and I know about this because we were on this r project together trying to deal with this. So how do you fix this phenotyping bottleneck? So we need a mechanism to measure plants in a high throughput way. So you can have gantries, things like this. And they can be really good, but they're kind of limited in their scope and areas that they fit in. You could use drones, and that's kind of where we started, because you know, that's kind of our area of expertise. But the problem with drones is that they don't see under the plant canopy. So what you really need are robots. And I mean, this is not new, right? I mean, robots have been around for a pretty long time. And if you really start digging into the literature and trying to see what's going on, you see that the main problem is cost and ease of use, or autonomy, right? So there are these two very nice papers by Pedersen and Blackmore, I think, is the senior author. Um, and they've studied the economic viability of robots, right? And so with a robot that looks something like this, costs about 27,000 euros at that time, with around 9,000, 12,000 euros for an RTK GPS, they found that it can barely match the, uh, or offset the labor cost of one person, and that was without taking into account all the four people that are trying to babysit that robot. So if you really look into this problem, cost is tied to logistics, you know, the manufacturing of the robot, and the ease of use, which is the autonomy. And this autonomy problem is really difficult in fields, right? Because field scales are really large. Data that you see in fields looks nothing like benchmark data sets, and you have to deal with uh, you know, situations like this. So this is the thing, this is the problem that we've been working on for the last um, around two years. So let me see if I can't. Uh, I thought I reduced the volume, but uh, anyway. So, we're building robots that go that are autonomous under the plant canopy, and and they can measure things as they go. And so this actually uh, won the best paper award last year here in RSS. So I was actually uh, it was at the Carnegie Institute, right, um, last year. 
So it was pretty cool because I was, I was able to come visit. So I'm very glad I can come back this year again. Um, so I'm going to talk about you know, how we got to this robot or this robot, really, and what are all the things, different things that we did on this way. So we started with a robot that was a lot more traditional for agricultural use, right? And so this was, uh, it was I can kind of inherit this robot. And it has tracks. So you'll see this is a sorghum field. That's 12 foot tall sorghum. That's 4 foot tall sorghum. And you'll see here, as it comes here, so it's, you can see the tracks, it's going to kill that plant right there. So there it goes. Oh, there it goes. The plant's kind of dead, unfortunately. So when we, you know, and it was, it was this classical concept of a robot, right? I mean, it's, it's big, and you know, it's supposed to kind of deal with all the different environments. And it's really good, because you can put a lot of different types of payload on it. But uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to get this thing automated and work in the field. So one of the things that we started doing when, when we were first faced with this problem is we started thinking about how can we simplify this concept of a sensing robot, right? And so we made this robot. This, was, this is a completely 3D printed robot, right? Which we literally took, uh, you know, we, I mean, literally a box on four wheels, right? Which has four motors. Um, we took the controller that was working on the drone and just used the yaw control part of it for kind of getting it to be autonomous before we started developing controllers. And what, and you know, our idea was, you know, how small can you make this thing and it can still work in the fields. When we started making this robot and we started showing it to growers and breeders, people really got excited. They're like, hey, this is such a small thing. I can just put it in the trunk of my car. I can just drive out to the field. I can drop it there. I can start measuring things. And so that was very exciting. So based on that, through this RPI project, since they were, they were really pushing us to try to you know, get the idea out there, last year we made, I think it was 25 of these 3D printed robots, right? So it's like the same, kind of the same model, but a little bit more uh, kind of compact, integrated. Uh, so you see those gimbal mounted cameras, it looks uh, like an engineer would design it, you know, uh, kind of like a Jeep kind of a feel. It's all completely 3D printed. And then we, 30 robots, I have the exact number. And we deployed it into the fields. And the idea was to actually, as Abhishek and I were talking about it, was to kind of capture that gap between the lab and practice, right? So a lot of the times in academia, we make our systems, robotic systems, we write a paper about it, and then we expect somebody to come and you know, make it happen in the real world. On the other side, industry is looking at us and is like, well, you, know, you made that one system, but is, there, is it really going to work in the field? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to get the system out there in the hands of people and use it and, and understand if there's actual use case for the system. So based on the learnings from this year, this year we made, or from last year, 2018. In 2019, we made this robot. And this time, we actually got a designer to do it. So Mike Hansen uh, was our designer. And this was done at um, a startup that we co-founded called EarthSense. So you see the robot right here. So it has a plastic shell, which is thermoformed. It has these uh, metal chassis. Uh, it has you know, these uh, resin cast wheels, brushless DC motors. It has three cameras, one, two, and three. And you know, they're just RGB cameras. And I'll tell you why that's the case. Two LiDARs, just 2D LiDARs, one here, one in the back. Remember, we're trying to minimize cost. So our goal is eventually, when we're making this at scale, we can get the cost to be, like manufacturing cost to be under $1,000, right? Uh, it has a um, fisheye camera, and then you can, put a GPS uh, sensor on it. So we made the robot, and we started trying to kind of make it autonomous. I don't want it to kind of run out of battery and start beeping. Um, started to kind of make it autonomous. Uh, so this is like kind of our, this was that in that paper, the RSS paper from last year, a uh, GPS-based autonomy using multiple control. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it right now. So you can see it's tracking the path on which it was. Uh, so the, the way you program this robot is you drive it on a path. And as you're going, it's kind of picking up the waypoints. And then once you're done, you hit the play button. And it basically has a control strategy that makes it go back on this thing. So the problem is, of course, you, know, you have your standard robot dynamics models. You know, and we assume that there's no slip. But if you can see, this robot as it's driving is basically driving by slipping. So you essentially have to handle the slip. So our, some of our early work was in trying to basically model that slip in and then learn it online using GPS and IMUs. So the way this is done was with nonlinear model predictive control for doing the control and a moving horizon estimator, which is estimating the states of the robot as well as the parameters of the robot. Right? So if you go through the detail, essentially solving is a very general formulation 
of an LQR, LQG problem, except it's fully nonlinear. So you have a uh, predictive controller, you have a predictive estimator, both of them are kind of closing the loop, and then all of that's implemented um, on the robot. So again, I'm not going to go through the details of all of the math right now, but you know the papers are cited there. You can go take a look at them. So with this mechanism, we were able to show that when we have nice access to GPS, we, GPS is directly shining onto the robot, we can make sure that the tracking error is less than 10 centimeters, never exceeds 10 centimeters, is mostly less than 5 centimeters, and we can adapt to different traction parameters. So even as you're going on to different um, terrains, you can deal with it. We can also deal with uh, uh, kind of um, dropouts of GPS. So this was all very good. But the problem was that as we started going under the planned canopy, GPS, of course, is not as reliable, right? So you get multipath error. And so if this is us going down this canopy, and you see this is the GPS return. This is a $9,000 GPS receiver, which is using an RTK correction. And you can see the errors are up to 40 centimeters, right? Which is not good enough to navigate in a 100 centimeter kind of uh, row, right? So, uh, so we had to move to basically this LiDAR-based autonomy. So most of this year, we've been working on getting LiDAR-based autonomy to work really well uh, in fields. So there's a front LiDAR, here's our robot going through the field. I'll show you the, um, another video. So here's this video um, of this robot. And so we've gotten it to work now where we basically you know autonomy is like a pretty generic word, right? So when sometimes when you say, um, and th this is like when we as engineers and roboticists talk about autonomy, we have a pretty specific meaning of what that word means. But if you tell that, to biologists, they expect that it's going to go around, and if there's an obstacle, it's going to jump over it, and you know, <laughs> cook me breakfast while it's doing it. So when we say that we, you know we got it working now, what we mean is that we've basically these 40 robots that we've made um, have been deployed all the way across the country in Illinois, in um, California, in New York, and in Australia and in Brazil, and we've m measured the distance between interventions. So if you let it lose in a row, uh, how long before an average failure case, right? So before it runs into something. So in this case, basically our distance between intervention has kind of like grown uh, to over 100 meters. And 100 meters is a very significant number in agriculture because 120 meters is the average length of a row, right? So basically this means a robot comes out from the other end. And the underlying problem is kind of this, right? So this is the LiDAR scan that we're getting from the robot. And what we need to do is fit lines on this LiDAR scan, right? So, uh, you know, it's like basically you can see that this significant, so we're getting res uh, returns from the, um, the row that we're in, from the crops that are on the row, as well as the leaves that are coming in the way and the, cro the crop that's in the other row, right? So the problem is how do you kind of disambiguate between all of those uh, different returns and figure out where exactly uh, that row is. So this appeared in the um, in JFR last uh, earlier this year actually, um, in which uh, basically we showed like you know there's an algorithm. What the algorithm is actually so you know the classical way of going after something like this is ransack right uh, because you okay, it's a, it's an outlier in layer problem. But the problem with something like ransack is that it's non-deterministic. So if you try to implement it on a robot, there's no guarantee that it's always going to find a row. So in this particular case, what we're doing is we're using the structure of the row. So we're kind of, we kind of know how far, um, the, what, what the distance between the rows is. And then we go through um, and kind of decide which, part, which points are lying inside, which points are lying outside. It's a completely separate estimation from right and left. And then from that, we kind of try to figure out where the rows are. So it's been working pretty reliably. So this is a case where there is basically damage in the field. Uh, so there's no crop on one side, and there's just crop from the other side. The robot goes through. Uh, this is another case where basically it's raining, and there's a lot of weeds. So in situations like this, uh, the distance between interventions is, uh, is still not as high as we'd like it to be. Uh, but still, it's pretty reasonable. Um, so it's about 80 meters or so, uh, which means one to two interventions. Uh, in fields like this. But you can see there's like a lot of weeds, and it'll go forward. And there's also gaps. You see those gaps between the fields. And in this case, there's a gap and a weed. So it just kind of runs over it um, and keeps going. This is kind of the boundary of, uh, of, the, of the 
kind of kind of workability of this type of an algorithm, right? So this is late stage soybean. So it's a lot more cluttered as well. The not only the floor, the floor has a lot of like basically um, stubble left from corn, and also you see there's a, like a little kind of clump of soil. Uh, but there's also clutter from the leaves, right? So the lidar return, as you can imagine, is pretty horrible uh, from what we're getting. So in this case, it's a lot harder for the robot to follow. And this is actually going to fail towards the end. I always make it a point to show the cases where it doesn't work, right? Because uh, you know, there's a lot of still work left to be done. So in this case, it just kind of got stuck because of something, but you know, kind of keeps going. And here now, it's finally going to get, start to get confused, and it'll kind of run into the crop right there. So what happens there? This is an example, right? So there's a weed here in the middle, and that's the LIDAR return. And this is like a nominal case when things are good and you can kind of fit the line. So basically, you can't disambiguate just with the LIDAR whether, uh, you know, it's whether there's something in the way. So um, the question is, you know, how do you go forward, right? I mean, do we use, or certainly we have to use vision, uh, but is that vision completely kind of learning based, or we do something more classical with semantic segmentation um, and context aware slam? So these are some of the questions uh, that we're kind of working on right now. The other part of the story is the analytics, right? So as the robot is driving, it's kind of collecting data. And it's, as it's collecting data, we want to kind of analyze that data and create numbers based on this data. So this was one of our earlier results. This was in that RSS paper. And it was essentially kind of an attention-based detection of corn. So it's a purely detection-based system, strained on deep learning. As it drives, it's kind of finding the corn. And if it finds it, there's like a mechanism to kind of um, make, you know, if the, the spacing between corn is not consistent. So there's a mechanism to kind of decide how many corns did it actually see uh, between, a, between a mechanism. And this was OK. We were kind of getting about 80% or 85%, 90% accuracy, depending on where we were. But the very interesting thing, so we weren't really sure if this is useful, right? So we, we, had, we had these results like late 2017, early 2018. As we started showing them to people, uh, breeders, and it was like, well, is this useful to you? Right? I mean, you know, this is, uh, I mean, we, it could probably get better, but is it useful to you? So one of the, the key kind of points that they started raising, well, well, you know, the good thing is that even though maybe you're not as accurate as you could be, um, I can trust these results because they're repeatable. Right? And you'll see that story as we go through and see other analytics. So since then, we've been working on other algorithms. So this is a version of basically a detect and track algorithm. Right? So the big challenge with counting is double counting. Right? So you can, detection is easy. Any, you know, kind of like you take a RCNN or faster RCNN, it'll just work immediately. Right? The, other, the problem is, how do you make sure that you're not counting the same thing twice? So in this algorithm, what we're doing is we're using optical flow and the robot motion to kind of predict where this corn, once we find it, where it's going to appear again. And then when it appears there again, we use template match to fix it. It's similar to deep sort, if you guys know deep sort, uh, but it's kind of using the robot motion. And all the algorithms I'll show you now, I think that's one of the main salient feature with them is that it's using more than one sensor data from the robot to kind of figure out what, you know, how, to kind of use, use the motion to its benefit, right? Um, so like this, this is young corn results. You can see the performance is, is pretty good. And you know, I mean, again, like deep learning has been just really great with this, but deep learning by itself is not enough, unfortunately. Uh, you have to, you know, add like deep learning in with motion or there's some really interesting challenges there uh, that can be dealt. But we've gotten this to work pretty well now. This is the same algorithm now, driving at about mile an hour, right? And the, uh, the error rate is about 3.5%. So again, you can see those dots, that, that that's the algorithm. So there's three squares there. So there's a, um, let's see if I can rerun that. Let's just rerun this, okay. So there's a green, red, and a blue. So green is when it detects it the first time. Red is if it can find it again. And blue is when it loses track. So when it loses track, it increments the number uh, by one, right? And so this is uh, you know, kind of the very interesting uh, mechanism for counting this thing. The other things we've been able to do is uh, taking that LiDAR scan from the back LiDAR and the odometry from the robot, reconstru okay. reconstruct uh, 3D. <laughs> Your time's up. All right. <laughs> okay, we get the lights. 
So this is 3D reconstruction after the fact. It's essentially forward slam, right? So you take the odometry. So there's no corrections yet. I mean, you can probably run the corrections. This is something we're working on. But basically do a line scan and complete 3D reconstruction of the crop. So this is, I, you know, I think it looks really pretty. Uh, we're still trying to figure out exactly how to use it, other than for height, which is pretty obvious. But, uh, but the breeders are really excited when they, oh my god, 3D reconstruction, right? So some of them, they're talking about this notion of like Google Earth View, or like Google Farm View. So once you start connecting these uh, LiDAR scans with pixels, you can basically like kind of sit in here. That's, that's, the, that's essentially the goal uh, that we're going after, right? Not having the breeders ever be in the field, but they can still do breeding. Um, because nobody wants to be in the middle of the field measuring the width of a corn plant when it's 90 degrees outside and the corn leaves are trying to cut your face as you're walking through there. So this year, uh, these very capable biologists from University of Illinois, so that's Justin McGrath, uh, that's Matt Siebers, uh, they are the postdocs, and this is Carl Bernacki and Steve Long, uh, who are kind of the advisors. They had these robots in the fields, and they did 17 full field LiDAR scans. Now we're talking about 40 acres, again, the same field that I was showing you, similar field, it's a different year, 800, 900 and something varieties on the diversity panel. So 17 full field LiDAR scans. And by the end of it, when they got, uh, they, they were getting really good at it, they were able to go through the 40 acres with three robots uh, and three people kind of monitoring those robots in just under two hours, right? Which is phenomenal because, uh, and car that led to like some statements about, you know, that the number of plants that are just being measured by this robot probably outnumbers all the plants that they've ever measured, right? Uh, manually, right? So, but this is just one plot, right? I mean, so this is that one particular range, 17 times, multiple times, uh, so 17 times they've measured. You can see, uh, so, so you can see that's, so the way these fields are split are in plots. And each plot has a coordinate of a range and a row, right? So for those uh, kind of, um, that, for that range, what this plot is showing is manual, so manual measurements versus the robot measurements, right? So if you have a basically a very small R squared, it means that it's kind of, uh, they're kind of matching. So with these, you can see, uh, that these uh, things are, um, you know, that we can really measure multiple times and um, then do and, and much faster than humans can. Uh, they've also done studies on, um, on finding out, figuring out whether or not the variance between what the robot is measuring uh, and, you know, and between people. So, of course, uh, as roboticists, this is not really surprising to us, but, uh, but in general, the point is that the robots can have a lot less variance and and, and in cases where sometimes it's not clear uh, whether people are more accurate or robust. So the ground truth comparison is not as important as the variance-based comparison. Because at the end of the day, you know, you, you know, the robot is a tool for measuring something, right? So as long as it consistently measures, so it's, it's okay to be consistently wrong. That's kind of the idea, right? You don't have to be, because you know, truth is dependent on the way mechanism of measurement. These are some results from folks in Cornell. So that's uh, um, Ed Buckler and Joe Gage is the postdoc working on it and Mike Gore. And what they've been doing is they've been taking these LiDAR scans, directly feeding them through deep neural networks and correlating them with yield. So instead of trying to do height and width and all of these other measurements that typically uh, humans would do, they're trying to completely bypass that whole loop, directly going from the robot data to the yield data. And what they've been finding is that the, that the phenotypes, what they call latent phenotypes, they contain a lot of useful information, and they're actually heritable, which means that these are actually usable phenotypes. And that is a very promising and interesting direction, because that means that we probably don't have to deal with doing all those detections that humans are good at doing, but directly just take the data and feed it into these problems. And if you scale this up, we'll have the types of data set that people have been looking for for a long time for, for genome-wide association. But this is another kind of interesting result. This is stem width estimation, right? So what we're doing here is using something similar to a mask RCNN. We're first finding the stems of the, of the plants, ignoring all of the background. And then we get the pixel width. We use the LIDAR to kind of convert that pixel width to uh, units, to you know, SI units. 
So this is really cool because when we show this to breeders, their eyes just light up because that means you know hours saved <laughs> trying to go into the field and measuring things uh, with a vernier caliper. Another thing you notice, so this is sorghum. It's a lot more cluttered. Uh, another thing you'll notice is that see all those red spots um, on that on that um, plant on those several of these plants. So that's that's similar to this disease called the red rust disease. So one of the very cool things with these robots and being so close to the plants is that you can get uh, kind of a view of the plants under the canopy that you simply cannot get from the top. A lot of the diseases start at the bottom and then they move, make their way up. So by the time they're visible at the top, it's kind of already too late. So this uh, going under the canopy really helps in doing that. And of course, uh, the way to do this is to create these uh, uh, Fun data sets, uh, in you know, which uh, which is where uh, we're, we're. I think we're talking about some notions of trying to make these open because this is not fun when you actually make them. But uh, but they. But but one of the great things that we have found is that um, taking existing deep learning models that are kind of trained on um, on data that is widely available, and then just basically kind of transferring those weights and tweaking them a little bit seems to be working. So that's good news. Right, so we don't necessarily have to have you know thousands of labeled images to make meaningful predictions in ag. We can just start with something that we already have. So this is this is a completely different year and a completely different growth stage, and we can still see that with deep learning uh, and these types of models that we're using. There's a pretty re reasonable uh, kind of expectation of accuracy and things that we're getting. So we're still characterizing them. This is kind of the border of where um, of what we can do, right? So this is detecting corn from looking up with a lot of occlusion, right? So the detection part works pretty well. Uh, the tracking is going to be really challenging here, right? And another big problem is also detecting the height of the years uh, from this view. But I think the detection part is is working kind of really well. So. Again, I mean, you know, I think the potential for this type of measurements is uh, is pretty strong. There's a lot of different things that can be done: heading date, year height, lodging, disease. I think at this point, we have just got so many requests for doing a lot, lots of different things. We're kind of like uh, behind in doing all of these different types of uh, types of things. Um, the same kind of the system we've also validated it in um, specialty crops. So this is in California. This is tomato. So the robots kind of driving. Um, in tomato, this is in a much drier and clumpier soil, uh, basically following furrows. So you'll see a lot of the things are planted in furrows. So the robot's kind of um, driving in the middle. Uh, you can do night operation um, with the, basically using the lights on the robot. Um, let me see. If this, is, this is cotton. So this is not autonomous right now. Uh, this is a very challenging autonomy problem, right? It's basically slipping. That soil is so dry that you know it's basically like gravel. So this is a robot going through water, and it's pretty robust and reliable. This is uh, almonds, and what I'll show you now uh, is the 3D reconstruction. Let me see. Uh, okay, so this is a 3D reconstruction. I think there's also a lot of space for improving the camera because if you're looking up, there's a lot of light shining onto the robot, so. I think there's some work that, 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 that folks have done here. So with the line scans, again, we can reconstruct uh, the field. And once that's done, we can find width of the, of the almond rows. Uh, so that's really an interesting direction. This is in vines, uh, driving under the canopy, um, keeping distance. So basically, you, know, you kind of got the idea, right? So we're talking about robots that are designed for phenotyping. Uh, which means essentially measuring plants, right? And I think there's a pretty direct correlation with taking these robots and then employing, employing them for scouting, which is measuring plants in production fields so you can make decisions on things like spraying. But this is a pretty good kind of segue to kind of take a step back and look at you know, how agriculture functions in this country uh, and pretty much around the world and what are all the things that are wrong with it. So the truth of the matter is that agriculture the way we do it today is fundamentally broken in many different ways, right? So this is kind of the example of classic what we call modern agriculture, right? So you have this large equipment, you have these huge monocultures, right? So you have acres and acres of the same crop, and you're controlling these monocultures with chemicals, right? So you probably have heard of pesticides in your beers. You've probably heard of nitrogen in the ocean. 
But there is this other problem called herbicide resistant weeds that is really proliferating around the world. So these are just a number of weeds that are now resistant to herbicides. So the way this happened is that around the 90s, uh, companies released a variety of seeds called Roundup resistant seeds, right? So these seeds, you can plant them and you can spray Roundup, which is glyphosate, and the plants won't die, but the weeds would die. So this led to a golden era of what people call spray and pray agriculture, right? Which is currently what we're practicing. I mean, you guys are so far away from this, but if you come to Illinois, you will basically see this, right? Acres and acres and acres of corn, but there's nobody there in the field, right? Which is very different, like if you go to Asia, it doesn't look like that at all, right? There's people in the fields all the time. And the reason that's, that happens here is because the seeds are very highly adapted to that environment and they're designed so that they can, basically you can just spray and just get rid of weeds and get rid of uh, diseases. But what happened is that as these Roundup resistant seeds were planted and people just started kind of like overusing chemicals, which is similar to like antibiotic resistant bacteria, these, some of these weeds mutated and they were already out competing the plant and there was nothing else to kind of like stop them. So they started proliferating. And now we have this barrage of broadleaf and grass-based leaves that are Roundup resistant. Pretty much everywhere, wherever we've had modern agriculture, we see this. Of course, uh, you know, the United States is at the lead, uh, like always, right? So, uh, uh, but you know, you know, everywhere we have modern agriculture, we have these. And some of these are like six-way resistant, so you basically you can't kill them uh, if you don't show up there manually. So six billion dollar year problem right now in Illinois. So there are fields that are abandoned because you know, they have these weeds. And it's about to be a $43 billion a year problem. This is just in Midwest, corn and soybean, right? This is not the whole, whole world. So if you're looking for a doomsday prophecy, this is pretty much it, right? Uh, so, and then if you look at the other side of the world, right? So this is in India. They also have herbicide resistant weeds, but they're handling it in a completely different way. They're handling it by basically exploiting labor, right? So these women are paid less than $2 a day, 100 rupees a day, to go and manually weed the fields. Right? And this is, this is a big problem, not only because you know, it's just wrong, but it also creates costs in other ways later on. In the medical system, for example, because this posture is just not natural right? for being out there and doing this. So, and if you just look at agriculture in general, right, this is a graph that shows how much money the farmer takes home. Right? And this is from 1910, this is the pie, uh, to 2010. Right? So, in the so-called modern agriculture, the, the, the chunk of the money that the farmer takes home is continuously reducing. On the top, the markets, the commodity buyers, pressurize the farmer, this, and that includes us, right? I am not going to pay more than $3 for a gallon of milk, right? Uh, so we're pressurizing farmers on commodity. From the bottom, the input providers, right, which are the people who are selling them the seeds, the chemicals, the tractors, um, are pressuring them on input costs, and the, the, the chunk of money that the farmer takes home continues to reduce. So even though the labor costs are dropping, right, so this is the cost of labor that's dropping, the costs of inputs keep increasing, right? So at the end of the day, without subsidies, farmers don't make any money, right? So the only way to get out of this is to grow big, right? So that's why we have 2,500 acres is the average size of a farm uh, in the U U.S. Midwest, right? That's, that's like, compare that to three acres to five acres in India and in other places, right? It's just crazy. And if you go to Brazil, it's thousands of hectares. I mean, acres, they don't even care about the word acre. It's in hectares, right? Um, so this trend, right, so, do, you know, it's just fundamentally unsustainable, right? And how do you kind of reverse this kind of uh, price pressure on agriculture? So there's been thinking about you know, automating equipment. So if you automate large equipment, you know, it can solve a part of the problem, but it doesn't solve the whole problem because you're still practicing the same unsustainable types of agriculture uh, that you're practicing today. So what we really need is more diversification in agriculture. right? So try you know, kind of growing different crops in the same places. And what we really, really, really need is trying to actually grow different types of crops at the same time. So, in the U.S. Midwest, before kind of uh, uh, the, the rise of modern agriculture, um, Native Americans uh, used to 
grow essentially polycultures and in a, in a specific type of uh, a group of, they're always used to grow a group of plants. So one of those groups of plants is known as the three sisters, right? So in the three sisters, you grow corn, you grow beans, and you grow basically um, like squash. And the idea, well, they didn't know what is going on, but beans fix nitrogen, right? So there are specific types of microbes on beans that basically convert nitrates into, uh, or you know, soil nitrogen into nitrates, which then fertilizes the corn. And the squash wraps around the corn, which prevents it from lodging, which means if you get a lot of wind, the stalk doesn't break, right? So you can have much bigger kind of ears. So this is polycultures, right? So polycultures is different plant species that are helping each other growing, being grown together. And if you think about it, right, the Amazon forest, uh, I don't know if you've read the book 1491, right? But if you just look back into history, uh, it is impossible. How did the, how did South America support such a large population in the tropics, right? Uh, without metal and other types of tool. So the way they did it is by essentially adopting the forest to grow berries and nuts and perennial crops that would basically uh, kind of help them grow. So they had this concept of massive food forest. So if you go into the Amazon, there's so many trees and you know, fruits that you can actually eat, right? Which is not normal in forests around the world. But the problem is we can't get to these types of more complicated agricultural systems without fundamentally improving the equipment that we have, right? So one of the hypotheses that we have is that decentralizing farm equipment, creating teams of robots, will really help in making sustainable agriculture profitable. And the idea behind that is really, if you have teams of robots, then you create technologies for agriculture that are scale neutral, right? So right now, like I said, in order to be profitable, you have to go at a high scale. Right? So you have to have 2,500 acres or thousands of acres of crop so that you know, you're kind of hedging your bets and you're making enough money. If you have small, if you're a small holder, all you're doing is just taking risk, right? You don't really have a way to get out of it. And you really don't have access to equipment either, right? Because a combine harvester costs $500,000. People have tried sharing the equipment, right, through things like the cooperative movement, but that doesn't work because everybody needs the equipment at the same time. So if you can create small robots, then you create a technology that scales up as well as scales down. So if you have a small farm, you use a fewer robots. If you have a large farm, you use a large number of robots, right? So we've, we've had, you know, we've, we have some, several projects in this area. This is um, one of our NSF CPS projects. This is a paper that appeared uh, last year in IROS and this year in Computers and Electronics in Agriculture. And this is basically a team of robots collaborating to kind of uh, uh, find the hot spots in the field and weeding, right? So what's happening is that each of the robots can only see the row that they're in and the row next to them. So this basically becomes a planning problem under partial observability. So where do you go and how do you allocate your resources to kind of find the hot spots? Um, so the, the way we've solved this problem is with bandits and um, it's kind of in those papers that you can see. Uh, this is just an example of uh, the robot with a weeding device behind it running autonomously uh, through the field. Uh, and you know, this is kind of late season. So this is in general a very good idea because lighter robots avoid soil compaction. So if you have smaller equipment, you can you know, basically don't have to, the soil doesn't get compacted as much, which means you can potentially be a lot more productive. So in the fields today, we have a huge issue with these very heavy tractors compacting the soil. And the really cool thing about this is if we can make little robots work, right, we can basically decentralize farming, right, which means that if you have a very little garden, right, in the, in the city, it can be tended by robots, which means you can completely decentralize the way food is grown. So you might have heard of like, you know, population growth and we need to increase yield. If you really look at it, we already make enough food to feed 7 billion and potentially 10 billion. But the problem is a lot of it gets lost in transport and on the fields. And, and a lot of that happens because the agricultural system that we have is not diversified, it's extremely centralized, right? We can grow vegetables here in Pennsylvania, but we import them from California, right? Which is like pretty much the other side <laughs> of the United States. The same, in, the same in Illinois, 
So why do we do that, right? So if you try to look at the socioeconomic problem, you see that people are, you know, comfortable with doing what they know how to do, and they don't, you know, they don't really have the kind of the equipment and the knowledge to kind of switch and do different things. Plus, there's like logistics and pipeline, pipe chains and everything kind of just integrated and around those types of systems. But if we can make little robots, you know, we can, you know, we the pesticide runoff from lawns is more than from corn, right? So lawn is a completely kind of a, like a, it's not a productive ecosystem. The, the only thing it does, it looks good, right? Uh, and we put a lot of inputs. I'm sure that all of you who have lawns know the amount of uh, effort you have to go to do that. So the idea is if we can make robots, maybe we can, uh, you know, uh, do that better. But to do that, of course, you know, there's big challenges, right? Uh, from where we are and where we need to go, right? So these are tractors, right? The mo modern equipment. So they're not very dexterous, but they're very, um, they can scale up. Humans are here, right? So they're highly dexterous, but you know, they don't scale up. Unfortunately, robots, ag robots are here, right? They're neither dexterous, <laughs> they don't scale up either. What we need to do is bring them here. And you know, I think George is a pretty big proponent of this view, uh, that we need to like, bring dexterity as well as decentralization and reduction of cost to really bring about change in agriculture. I'm hoping that at least some of you will get motivated by this and start working on uh, interesting problems in dexterous robotics. So this is our project with National Robotics Initiative. And what we're doing here is essentially making soft arms for robots, right? So people have been trying to do hard arms, like standard industrial arms uh, in fields, and this is typically not been very successful. So the idea here is can we make soft or hybrid arms? Now, I think making the arm, so the way these works, uh, so this is completely manually driven right now. The control is a big problem. The way these work is that each of these tubes, when you pressurize them, they bend in a different way, right? So by controlling the pressurization, you can get that arm to bend in all kinds of different ways. So of course, but doing the control is a very challenging problem. So this is, uh, this year we had this paper at Ikra, let's see if it works. Oh, oh, sorry. So this is control of soft arms uh, using um, basically deep, uh, deep reinforcement learning, right? So DDPG, uh, it's going in and uh, trying to hit all of those points as it drives. So I really like these results because I find this to be a really meaningful application of reinforcement learning. So these, the control of these arms using traditional methods is really hard. They have a lot of hysteresis, right? So uh, you, know, you can't just find um, simple linear strategies to kind of control them. So it's really nice, you, know, you can use reinforcement learning and techniques like that to kind of make it work. Of course, the challenge is you know, how much data do you need uh, to kind of go from simulation into the real world. So that's been a pretty interesting problem that we're trying to solve. There's also some really fundamental issues uh, in controlling these arms. For example, the workspace warps, right? So if you put a load on top, uh, the motions or the locations that the arm can go really changes quite a bit. So for example, it's not able to reach this thing, right? Yeah, it's trained in simulation, then we uh, apply it on the, on the real robot directly. Yeah. And basically, if you look at the paper, the main thing is we're using the feedback between the target location and the location of the end effector as the sensor signal, which brings a lot of robustness when we move it into the real world. So that's one of the interesting things that we're doing. The other thing that we're doing, of course, you know, a lot of this, like, you know, this is a really great segue to my next point, is that you really need to move from simulation to real world in a lot of these very difficult dexterous problems, right? So if you look at reinforcement learning, we kind of focus on uh, this holy grail of directly end-to-end -end learning, directly finding the solution uh, to the problem. But if you, you know, most animals and humans learn in increments, right? Of, you know, taking a behavior, adding more kind of meat on top of that and going forward with that. So um, we've been looking at how can we do behavioral adaptation in reinforcement learning. So the idea, you know, this is one very good example. So if I've learned a policy on a mountain car, can I transfer it to balancing a pendulum? Uh, so in this, this is a paper from ICRA last year. Uh, so in this case, from the pendulum then, can I take it and use it to balance a bicycle, right? So the, 
the way we're doing it in that particular paper is we have the source policy uh, and we have a online learn model of the task that we're trying to do. We take the difference between these two and use that to adapt the source policy after transferring it uh, to the target domain using a, a manifold alignment map. Right? So this is, uh, uh, you can take a look. Uh, this is a, another kind of way of doing that. Uh, so instead of doing an actual, so in order to do the previous thing, you have to assume a fineness in control, right? Uh, but if you don't have that, if you have like a stochastic transition models, then instead of doing a difference, you can do basically a KL divergence and then look at basically uh, create a reward of following the source policy as well as getting the real, um, following the real policy. So basically a mixing parameter beta that decides between the environment reward and the um, reward of following uh, kind of the trajectories prescribed by the source policy. And then using that, you can kind of optimize that. And um, we're getting pretty good results um, in, this, in this kind of thing. So this is basically cheetah uh, with, you know, you change the weight uh, of the cheetah. Uh, this is slippery hopper, so you change the friction coefficient. And this is a slippery fat walker. This is all Mujoku simulations. Uh, so these are, that's kind of where we are, like, you know, it's a pretty good uh, kind of just this notion of transferring behaviors uh, seems to be working uh, pretty well. So that's uh, an idea that, you know, I think will be really useful on this thing. And if you really look at, you know, kind of some of the, the underlying science. So these are, these are some of the results that, you know, you can get with deep learning, right? So this is, so if you take the DDPG policy and just change a little bit the weight and the friction, it just completely fails, right? And this is, you know, this is a policy that was learned to walk and it just, you know, doesn't look normal. On the other hand, if you look at this, so this is our octopus, right? And so why do we have an octopus? I'll tell you in a second. But, <laughs> but this octopus went and opened <laughs> this jar and found the shrimp in four tries, okay? So four tries from basically looking at this thing and just opening that jar and finding that shrimp in there. So what is it that these animals are doing, right, that enables them to learn and do these kinds of crazy things over and over again? So, in re in, so the reason we have an octopus is because we just got, uh, we just started this uh, MURI project on cyber octopus, right? So the idea is that, you know, these arms that we are trying to control, you know, they are, they're essentially motivated from octopuses and elephant trunks, right? So how are these animals controlling these arms? So in this MURI, what we're, trying, what we're doing is we're basically kind of doing a Turing test. We're making a completely simulated version of an octopus, which includes the full three-dimensional kind of physics uh, using models of Kozarat rods. And we are making the brains of the octopus using neurons that are actually similar to neurons in human, uh, you know, in not human, but in biology. So the neurons that we use in neural networks look like this, right? They're basic static nonlinearities. They're either on or they're off, right? And they're essentially, essentially gating functions. Um, either they're smooth or, you know, some of them are not even smooth, like a ReLU, it's not even smooth. But neurons in biology are dynamical systems. And they encode information not only in gating, but also in kind of the frequency of their update rates. So one, you know, very interesting question is when you go from this to that, how can you create new types of algorithms that, uh, that make things learn? And this is it's a very recent project that we've just started. This is my last slide. Uh, just, you know, kind of just uh, showing you the team. So this is uh, me and Prashant. We are the two controls people there. So Matia is working on uh, the, making the 3D models um, of the octopus. And then we have a group of very capable biologists. So Gilly, uh, Ivan, they're from Stanford. Uh, and Raynar, they all work on neurobiology. And, and John Rogers works on sensors. Uh, that can be embedded um, onto, the, um, onto the octopus. Anyway, so uh, again, just kind of finishing the talk. Um, the idea is that small robots can make sustainable ag profitable, right? The challenge is in driving adoption. I mean, this, this idea, I think, makes a lot of sense. You know, there are technological challenges that we can all, you know, write proposals and, and do theses on, on solving. But the other part of the problem is getting these robots into the hands of people, right? And basically driving adoption. So that is something you know, that you know, I'm really hoping that uh, people will get inspired and start working on these types of problems um, and help propel this forward. So.
right. Thank you. Um, so, uh, how close do you want to cut? The, no, I, uh, I can I can stay for a few minutes. A few minutes for yeah. questions. Um, so take it away. Who would like to ask a question? All right, so I can ask a question. Okay. Um, so have you done? I, I I love this vision about you know taking over the world with small robots and, and growing food. Have you done any sort of back of the envelope calculations, like how many robot, how many small robots will we need to replace all of the yeah. gigantic combines that are out there? Right now? So we don't know about that, but I think um, this paper here, right? So we did a study on uh, on a simulation of a field. Uh, if you're if you're doing mechanical weeding, how many robots do we need to actually make sure that there's no weed? Uh, coming and in the worst case uh, analysis, so we found that ten robots. Uh, this is again a worst case analysis. So there's no there's no competition from plants model. It's only the weeds. Ten robots can keep a field weeded, uh, uh, no matter how dense the seed seed bank density. Uh, field? So this is one acre. one acre, but this is the worst case kind of scenario. Right. So we just wanted to establish whether or not it's even possible to kind of do this type of stuff, right? Or are we just kind of dreaming? The question that you're asking. So it seems that it's possible. So, so 10 robots per acre, mm -hmm. 2,500 robots, 2,500 yeah. acres. Well, that's in the worst case, right? Right, right, right? So what we really think is when we you know, kind of optimize the system, should probably be about 5 to 10 robots uh, for about an 80-acre farm. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. And if you're the person selling those robots, you're in really good shape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a question about the, the row following the sorter plants. Uh -huh. So from what you were showing, you were following the row based on raw LIDAR points. Mm -hmm. um, but these sorter plants are sort of planted Right. Have you considered like actually segmenting out the sorghum plants and sort of backing out where those rows are for the row following, or are you just operating directly on the lidar? So right now we're working on the lidar points directly, and we're using the knowledge of how wide the rows are to kind of uh, basically get, give an initial guess and do things, and then fi after that iteratively figure out where the rows are. So I think there, you know, that's the next step is to use vision to kind of segment. We already have the algorithm, as you can see, we can find the, the stems, but Moving vision onto the robot actually um, is a problem of hardware integration, right? So you need to have the sufficiently powerful GPUs because the LiDAR thing just works on a Pi, Raspberry Pi. So, you know, it's really simple. But when you move vision onto the robot, you know, I think, you know, you need to have a GPU and, um, and you need to deal with heat and all those types of things. But that's definitely where we're going. Yep. Uh, with regard to the um, polyculture, um, does that still allow to, for having those rows that the robot can explore, or would you need to design some other way of, of sort of getting into those plants because they might be grown very densely together? Yeah, yeah. So I think it really depends. I mean, I think there's still definitely a space for row type polyculture. So polycultures is a pretty broad uh, concept, right? So um, you can have pol so this is an example of a cover crop based polyculture, right? So there's a cover crop. And then there's a regular crop. So you can have these two different types of crops. So you can still have a row structure. That concept, that's the food forest concept. That probably is going to need robots that you know, don't have wheels, maybe, right? Can climb trees and stuff like that. But I think there, you know, there's steps in between that you can still have different types of plants growing in row structure, so you can still fit in the row and do stuff. Uh, yep. So in these large monoculture crops, like specifically like corn, they end up being Combine harvesters, yeah. Um, but for other kinds of crops or these polycultures, or if you decentralize them to what you propose these small farms, you probably can't use something like a combine no. harvester. You guys plan on doing anything like adding a manipulator to that? Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. 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 I mean that's that was one of the things projects that I was showing you. Yeah. So that's yeah. The, the yeah, so that the purpose of the technical arm is to harvest berries. Yeah, it had a little end effector on it. I isn't didn't show that. So the the arm, the, not in that picture, but the 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 robot, that one there. When I mean, this is not a very good video. This is very recent. This literally is from a month ago. What? So it has an end effector. You see then, and it's also pressurized, soft end effector. No, yeah. So the manipulator, but at the end of it, does it have like a little? Yeah, yeah. You see, look at the video. Oh, see, see that thing, the white thing over there? Yeah. What's grabbing the berry? That is an end effector. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's all right. Yep. Uh, one of the things to consider is that uh, you know, crops like uh, uh, rice or paddy, yes. they need a lot of water. Yep. Right? So, so have you thought about uh, how you could uh, how you could navigate through such surfaces? Yeah, I mean, I think so. These these are brushless DC motors, so in theory they're okay with water. So we've been driving them through water; they're fine. Uh, but I mean, you know, it would be a different robot design, uh, some kind of an amphibious robot design. But I mean, you know, again, it's like a systems problem, right? We have to sit down and design the system. Yep. This is a more general high level question, but do you have a hypothesis on the type of crops that are going to be automated first? So, like uh, specialties versus large grades, and the type of operations that are going to be automated first? That's a very good question. Um, I think the need to automate is highest in commodity crops. But the problems to automate are the most difficult in commodity crops. Not because the crops are more complex, but because the scale is really large. So I can drive a robot, like I, you know, we have the ingredients, right? We have autonomy in the row. We can put some kind of manipulators on the back to kind of make weeding happen, right? But in order to cover the 20 million acres of corn, I, I'm going to need, like George pointed out, a lot of robots, right? So yeah, but that's where the, 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 the needs are the most. In specialty crops, your profit margins are a lot higher. So labor is an issue, um, and I think labor can be handled in multiple ways. But the pressure is, I mean, you know, ov obviously people want to keep more money in their pockets. But the pressure is not as much as in, com as in commodity crops. Okay. So I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> OK. One more question. Anyone want to throw one last one out there? All right, excellent. Thank okay, you. OK, thank you so much. Very, very good. Oh, thanks.